guidance out. The nursing homes will be announcing later today a new priority of inspections for infectious diseases. We're detailing that. We explained it to the industry today. And also on the issue of testing, Mr. President, uh, you've made that a priority. We'll, we'll have over a million tests in the field today. I spoke to several governors this morning that were grateful for the fact uh, that the changes you made this weekend through the FDA now make it possible for state health uh, clinics as well as universities around the country to be able to conduct coronavirus tests. But we'll also uh, be meeting this afternoon uh, with leaders of uh, our commercial laboratories to make a coronavirus test more rapidly, more widely available for doctors' offices and medical clinics uh, and, uh, and, and uh, consumers around the country. So, Mr. President, as you said, it is a, a whole of government approach, but in a very real sense, it's a whole of America approach. Uh, and I've already expressed, and I know you, you feel, a great deal of gratitude to our partners uh, in industry and in the airline industry for acting on your priority to put the safety health of the American people first. Good, Mike. Thank you very much. I just want to add, if I might, uh, and to go a little bit further, the Obama administration made a decision on testing that turned out to be very detrimental to what we're doing, and we undid that decision a few days ago so that the testing can take place in a much more accurate and rapid fashion. Uh, that was a decision we disagreed with. I don't think we would have made it, but for some reason it was made. But we've undone that decision. Uh, also, when people come in from certain areas, we're uh, doing checks not only at the site of takeoff, but at the site of landing. So when they land in our country, we'll also do — that's if the planes are leaving from certain destinations. Uh, I might uh, ask, Doctor, if you could, I'd like you to say a few words. You've been doing a fantastic job in just a short time. We haven't had much time, but you've really been doing a fantastic, a really fantastic time. Please. Thank you. Well, before you came in, Mr. President, we, t we talked about which Americans are most vulnerable um, and the fact that younger Americans may not be as vulnerable. So we're really focused very much in that way, and I think the airline industry can help us also in any kind of screening required, particularly to protect our older Americans. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Doug, do you have anything to say? Um, no. Thank you for having us. Uh, thanks for the, the work we're, we're doing jointly to keep people safe. Um, we're proud of our team. Uh, we're proud of the work they're doing. Uh, we appreciate the aggressive containment efforts that uh, the United States has done to uh, protect Americans and, uh, and the role we played in that. And uh, so we're, we're happy to be here. And, uh, continue to uh, be interested in everything, anything we can do, um, as, and particularly as we move from uh, maybe aggressive containment to mitigation efforts, what, right. what can be done there as well. Doug is the head of American Airlines, as you know. Maybe we'll go around the room if you'd like to say something, please. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And uh, again, we appreciate the leadership, appreciate the collaboration and, and coordination, and, and certainly the industry wants to do everything uh, that we can to uh, keep Americans safe uh, and certainly. Uh, uh, our, our employees and our customers. Uh, we've, we've stepped up our efforts to make sure the airplanes are clean and disinfected, uh, and uh, we work very closely with the CDC, and I think that's gone very, very well. Uh, so we've got the proper protocols in place whenever there is uh, a, sus a suspected uh, illness, and uh, I think all that's working very well. Where I think everybody's doing a great job, and doing all they can. We appreciate the job you're doing. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, Brad Tilden with Alaska Airlines. We appreciate the, the efforts, Mr. President. Uh, I think like all of the folks around the table, the, the focus of the airline leadership teams is the, the safety of our employees and the safety of our customers. And that's how we're focused. I think all of us have made a lot of changes to our cleaning procedures, changes to our onboard procedures, to gloves, sanitation the service that our flight attendants are providing our customers, and we're trying to do everything we can to help help everyone contain the virus and uh, contain the spread of it. And uh, we, we appreciate it. We're, we, if there's more that we can do to help, we, we want, we're want we here to tell you that we want to do that. Are you using different things for the cleaning, the, the fluids? Are you using different we've cleaning We've taken devices? a good look at them. The stuff that we're using, I think we've concluded is effective, but we are changing the routines. And there's three levels of clean that we do, and we're uh, intensifying the, the cleaning of the aircraft. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great job. Peter? Peter Ingram with Hawaiian Airlines. Mr. President, uh, I echo um, 
my counterparts in the industry talking about the um, the safety of our uh, our guests and our employees is is paramount in everything we do, and we really appreciate um, the collaboration um, with the administration and the government to make sure that we are doing everything we can to uh, to ensure that. I think it is uh, it is very helpful to hear Dr. Burke's um, talk about um, the specific areas right. of risk uh, because there is a, a lot of concern out there. There's concern internationally about travel and there's concern domestically and I think the more information that we have to share with our guests about the facts is very helpful as we go forward with this challenge. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Matt Costco from Public Airways. Thank yes. you, uh, Mr. President, for uh, this opportunity for us to come together as leaders in the aviation industry um, and to have a sharing of information, which I think is critical. Uh, we all represent uh, the men and women that are on the front lines and, and need to ensure that uh, they have the tools, resources, and information to do their job each and every day so that these efforts are effective. And uh, the one thing the aviation industry has proven it does very well is it comes together in times of challenge to uh, provide a solution for this country. So I, I feel very confident that uh, with your leadership and uh, all the folks in the room that we will continue to serve first and foremost our uh, employees so they can serve the customers that depend on us. Very good. Chad, did you have anything to say, by the way? Well, I would just say, uh, Mr. President, that, again, at your leadership, we're funneling to 11 specific airports and contract medical staff that we put in place have screened over 53,000 individuals and prevented a number of folks from coming into the country. And that's largely due to the cooperation and the flexibility of the individuals in this room. So, again, thank you for everything that you're doing to help us uh, keep America safe. And Chad, anything different on the southern border where we're doing so well? We're setting records on the southern border in terms of allowing the people that are supposed to be here in, but not allowing others in. Anything new on the southern border? Well, again, from a screening standpoint, we have some of the same measures that we do at airports of entry, at our land ports of entry. So we, uh, CBP officers and, and, again, contract medical staff, some from HHS and, and some contract are, again, screening individuals and, uh, and referring to CDC as necessary. So some of the same procedures at airports taking place at land ports of entry as well as maritime ports of entry. So for DHS, we're looking at every way individuals come into the country, not just through the right. through the airports, uh, making sure that we're securing the country uh, as a whole. Good job. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you for having us. We were delighted when you were made the Vice President, uh, the head of the Interagency Task Force. Uh, we believe in collaboration. We want to try to solve these problems both short and long term. We've been sharing ideas with uh, the Vice President's staff and your staff. Uh, we think there are better ways to trace the passengers coming in. Uh, we've contracted to have a mobile app and a website developed that everyone will have to fill out that would go directly to CDC with that information, and we're moving forward with that. So. Um, there's been good progress. I think what we all need is the reassurance that you and the Vice President and others have been providing that travel is safe mm -hmm. and that we can go forward because right now the fear is almost worse than the virus. Yeah, now we're doing a good job. Uh, these professionals are really amazing. They've really stepped up, like the airlines have stepped up very much so. Thank you. Yes. Mr. President, Robin Hayes, JetBlue. Uh, thank you very much for having us today, Mr. Vice President. And, uh, a lot of it's been said, but you know we're doing taking many of the same measures as everyone else to uh, keep our customers and our uh, crew members, our employees, uh, safe and secure. Uh, thank you for putting the vice president in charge of these efforts. The federal government has a tremendous uh, capability when it comes together and is orchestrated with a common goal. And I'd just like to spend a, a, just a, a quick shout out to the. Uh, the people in the federal government and the people that work for all of us who are really in the front lines of this and the heroic efforts they're making uh, every day to keep us safe and secure. Thank you very much. Oscar? Uh, I'll take a different angle just because a lot of it's been said. Uh, I started my whole conversation earlier before you came in. The safety and health of our customers and our employees are the top one. So we will cooperate and collaborate with everything. Um, I think as I look through this from a personal lens, I'm a heart transplant survivor. I am. If you think of the poster child for the individual that could be affected by this, I am it. I'm older than the age and I have immune systems. And so that's the, the task we take at United about making our planes safe. We're exploring all the different ideas and aspects that we can do to, to ensure that our planes are as safe as possible. Uh, from the ASK perspective, anything that continues to project stability, calm, and Dr. Brex with regards to, uh, Dr., uh, with regards to behavior, 
Um, we even invented the Corona bump at United, where you'll see us all bumping each other. It may sound silly, but it's, it's a fun way of expressing what I think we all need to know is be careful for the next few weeks right. as we control this, that we adapt our behavior so that indeed we can uh, continue to stay safe. So thank you for everything that's And that's right, you are a heart transplant survivor. Yes, I sir. was reading about that as one of the big executives, great executives of our country of the world and your heart transplant, <laughs> I'll tell you, you look very good to me, Austin. <laughs> I don't recommend it. You have that one, Dad. Don't recommend it, but you, uh, that's a fantastic story. Wow, that's great. Thank you very much, Oscar. Mike, why don't you finish it up? Well, thank you, Mr. President. Again, uh, the American people deserve to know that the threat of contracting the coronavirus remains low, according to all our experts. Uh, but at your direction, we are going to continue to bring the full resources of the federal government, and we're going to enlist the full resources of American industry to keep the American people safe. And our airlines have been exceptional partners with us, uh, not only uh, the executives, but we also want to commend the crews that have been taking such good care of passengers, the people that are cleaning the planes, and keeping it all safe, and uh, working with us on the screening process and the funneling process. And, uh, as you said, Mr. President, we're, we're going to continue to lean into this effort, um, and uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we'll continue to do so until we, we find our way through uh, the impacts of the coronavirus. Uh, and when we accomplish that, uh, we'll accomplish it uh, as uh, one American people, as one team. And I'm grateful to have the people on the team here in the room. Great job, Mike. Uh, as uh, certain areas uh, get to be more of a problem, we may close them up, as we have done with numerous areas. Uh, at this moment, we think we have it very much in hand. We've closed certain areas down very strongly. Uh, in some cases, not whole countries, but certain areas within countries, like in Italy. Uh, we are, uh, I think, doing a very effective job in terms of that. It's very important. Uh, the one thing that we were discussing before is you really don't know what the percentage is. Some people will have this at a very light level and won't even go to a doctor or a hospital, they'll get better. There are many people like that. Uh, young people seem to be, you can't say immune to it, but they're certainly, the numbers are very small. Uh, and it does affect the uh, older people that, like the nursing home situation that we have on the West Coast, a single nursing home, where we have a pretty big percentage of people. But as things go along, so we're trying to adjust the number, we're trying to see what the number might be. Uh, but if you add, uh, you know, many, many people that have it and don't know they have it or they think they have a cold and all of a sudden they're recovering from it, I think that number will probably be a lot different number than the twos and even the one and a halfs that we're hearing. Uh, and I think that's an important thing for people to know. Uh, I'm very proud of the people in the administration. I'm very proud of the airline business. You said it very well when you said the airline business always seems to pull together. And I've seen that over the years. And, this is a great case of it, and I want to thank you all. You're great executives, and, and you love the country, and you love what you do, and thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. President, are you considering giving any sort of financial support to the airlines to deal with that loss of business from overseas travel? Don't uh, ask that question, please, because they haven't asked it. So I don't want you to give them any ideas, or you'll end up heading an airline. He'll end up heading an airline. That's a pretty tough question. So I don't know. They haven't, we haven't discussed that yet. All right, thanks, guys. Hopefully thanks, guys. What would you say to those who are flying? Is it safe to fly? What? Is your message that to Americans that it's safe to fly? And can you convince the traveling yeah, I think where that? these people are flying, it's safe to fly. And large portions of the world are very safe to fly. So we don't want to say anything other than that. And uh, we have closed down certain sections of the world, frankly, and they've sort of automatically closed them also. And if they'll understand that, and they understand it better perhaps than anybody. Yes, it's safe. Absolutely. Are American businesses overreacting to cutting down domestic travel and they're telling people not to fly to conferences inside the United well, States? Well, a lot of people are doing a lot of domestic business now. I can tell you, they're staying in this country. They feel safe because we have a, if you look at a percentage, we have a very, very small percentage. And a big percentage of what we have is when we brought in the 40 or so people from the ship. We brought them in, we immediately quarantined them, but you're adding that to the numbers that we had, which were very small. Now what we're going to do is, as people get better, because we have, you know, most of these people are getting better. Uh, some are already released, some are going home, some are, you know, get a full 100% report. Uh, we're going to take them off the list. But we have a very small number of people in this country. We have a big country, 
Uh, the biggest uh, impact we had was when we took the 40-plus people. Uh, they're Americans. I mean, I could say, don't let them into the country, but these are Americans, and they were literally stranded, and it was very unfair. We brought them back. We immediately quarantined them. But, but uh, you add that to the numbers. But if you don't add that to the numbers, we're talking about very small numbers in the United States. We've all done a very good job, all of us. And I think the news has been, and the, for the most part, the media has, tra has really treated us very fairly which I appreciate. I think it's very important. When people yes. get on planes, Mr. President, is there anything that they should be doing differently? Since you think it is safe to fly, well, you get on an airline. the head of American Airlines or United Airlines. Or Dr. The executives around the table that if you're a passenger, you get on that plane. We've been told, wash your hands. Yeah. Maybe uh, Dr. Burks. Dr. Burks would be the best, and then you can maybe say something, too. Well, we're always saying the common sense of washing <laughs> your hands, not touching your face. Um, ensuring that if you've touched anything, you go and wash your hands again. 20 seconds with soap. Um, hand sanitizers also work. But I think I was very reassured to hear the airlines talk about their cleaning procedures and their three levels of cleaning procedures, because I think that will be reassuring to the American public. And I haven't touched my face in weeks. <laughs> in weeks. Mr. President. I miss it. Would you do anything to address some of the um, concerns of maybe travelers who booked their flights and, you know, they might be, you know, coming up on a trip and they might have to make rearrangements. Is that something? Yeah, what would you say about that? Uh, we were, we, we just issued a, we, we put on a fair sale recently that allows customers the flexibility to book their travel uh, in advance. And if they, if they find they want to change that later, uh, the change fees are waived. So I think all of us are working to find, figure out ways to make sure there's flexibility for that. I would think. Oscar, how would you handle that? You have a lot of people they booked, and now maybe Listen, this is a time unprecedented in, nature, in, in our history that we need to be absolutely understanding of people's travel plans. And like, like yeah. Doug and most of the airlines, we are taking all appropriate measures to make sure that our customers get the best treatment. I think people recover. are going to be very impressed with what the airlines do. Okay. Mr. President, you mentioned an Obama-era rule that you had changed regarding yeah. This virus, I didn't follow that. What? Yeah, well, let's talk about it. Go ahead. We could talk. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Redfield, you might speak about the the last administration asserted FDA jurisdiction over testing and the development of tests like this. And Bob, the President changed that on Saturday, so that now, as, as I spoke to several governors this morning, uh, states now have the ability to actually conduct the coronavirus test in state labs university laboratories. Big difference. Um, and that, that's because of the change the President authorized. Bob, you just might very quickly reflect on the changing jurisdiction of that that's freed up more available testing. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. So um, in the past, we used to be able to have laboratories that could develop what we call laboratory-developed tests and then be able to apply them for clinical purposes. And in the previous administration, that became regulated. So that now, for someone to do that, they had to formally file uh, with the FDA. And what the President's decision did was uh, allow that regulatory relief now and that those university labs and those other labs in this country now can be fully engaged in developing laboratory diagnostics for the clinical arena so the men and women in this nation can get access to, and the doctors to get to know the extent of HIV and the patients that they're caring for. It's really very, very important. It's what's changed the availability of testing overnight. It was a very big move, and it was a, uh, it was something that we had to do, and we did it very quickly, and now we have tremendous flexibility, many, many more sites, many, many more people, and you couldn't have had that under the Obama rule, and we ended that rule very quickly. Yes? Mr. President, on the contact tracing, can you explain what you're hoping to get from these folks? What more information do they need to track or share with the government? Go ahead, Chairman. Sure. So what we're asking uh, for is additional pieces of information so that uh, the CDC, HHS, and others can track individuals as they come into the country uh, and as they continue on to their, uh, their final destination. And if uh, we need to, from a health perspective, to continue to reach out, continue to track them, and to get in touch with them, looking for a few more pieces of, of information and data from them. Do you think you'll get resolution in this meeting today on that? I think we will continue to have conversations, but yes, we'll get resolution. <clears throat> Can I follow up on that question? The North Carolina case with someone who was at the nursing home in Washington State, uh, does the administration now have the contact information who are, who are with that person on the flight to North Carolina? Uh, that uh, public health evaluation is ongoing right now, and, and we're 
working with the airlines and obviously with the North Carolina Health Department. CDC supports the local public health department to really work together to get all that information that's in progress. But at this point, you do not have that the, the, pers the passenger information of people we, who were we, on that flight. My understanding is we have the manifest. Now it's the, the trick is to go find them, and that's why we're having this discussion. And much of that has been done already. All right, thanks, guys. Let's Thank go. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Let's Can go. Can we have no questions on the Thank you. election? This has to be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All right, no, no. thanks, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Come on, guys. Jennifer, let's go. What did you think about last night? You invited us. It was the president. What did you think about last night? Well, I think the election was uh, great last night. Thank you. 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 But if you would have looked, if Elizabeth Warren would have done what she probably should have done from their point of view, uh, he would have won, right? He would have won a lot of states, including Massachusetts, probably Texas, definitely Minnesota. So Bernie would have won uh, states that uh, he lost and he lost fairly easily. But in particular, Massachusetts, I would say Minnesota in particular. I would also say Texas and uh, some others. So uh, had she I, — I put something out on it this morning. She was really a spoiler, because other people got out in those votes in order to Joe. <coughs> and uh, those people really helped Joe, you know, by getting out early, by the couple that got out and did the endorsement. Uh, in the case of Elizabeth Warren, had she gotten out, uh, it would have been a very different situation, I think. It would have been a very different night. Just that one simple move. Had she left, you pick up Massachusetts, Minnesota, and probably Texas. And those are the three I checked. I would imagine there are others that he would have picked up, too. So Elizabeth Warren was the single biggest factor in that election last night. Uh, it would have been a very different thing, and not in a positive way for her, in a very selfish way for her. She was very selfish from that point of view. Now, do I care? No, because we're just waiting to find out who we're running against. But when you look at it, pretty incredible. If she would have — if she would have gotten out and endorsed, even if she didn't — she didn't even have to endorse. I think there's a lot of bad blood there. But had she gotten out and endorsed, uh, he would have been uh, a lot better off. What do you think happens now? Well, now I think it's a very tough uh, — I think it's tough. I think Joe has an easier path right now, believe it or not. Uh, I see Minnie Mike just got out, and he's going to, you know, try and save face by putting some money into Biden's campaign. And uh, we'll see what happens. I don't think that's going to have an impact. You know, you got to look. If money has to be spent wisely. One thing this whole thing has shown that you can't buy an election. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Steyer put in $250, $300 million, and now who knows where he is? He's home probably licking his wounds. And Bloomberg put in probably a billion dollars. And, you know, sometimes you just don't have what it takes. And I said to him, it's not easy doing what I did, is it? So it's one of those things, you know. But uh, it's going to be very interesting to think that this would have changed so much. Because if you go before Saturday, before South Carolina, I mean, uh, he had — Joe had absolutely no chance, according to you people. But they used to say that about me, too. Not as much, though. I think I, I always felt that a very good chance. But I'd watch, and they'd say, well, can't happen. But it happened, and it happened pretty easily. Um, I think now it's — I think Joe actually would have the advantage now. You know, if you look at the states he's going to with Florida and others, I think he's got an advantage in those states. But again, had Elizabeth Warren endorsed Bernie, and you're talking about a whole different subject. And that's not even a question. You're talking about a whole — because he would have gotten 80, 90, almost — I mean, he would have gotten most of those votes. So you're talking about a much different thing. What do you mean to the stock market's reaction today? It seems like there's been a sigh of relief that — I think there is. I think — well, I've said from the standard. beginning, it's partially this. It's a, you know, big part of this. But it's also the fact that they didn't like seeing what they're seeing. But they don't like — they don't like Joe, either. Joe's become — you know, he's — a lot of people are with Joe. If you look at those people, they're worse than Bernie in terms of being radical left. I mean, some of Joe's handlers — and that's what they are, is handlers. I want to be nice, but they are handlers. Some of Joe's handlers are further left than Bernie. 
that's pretty scary. So it's going to be that way. Yeah. Do you think Bloomberg's money will be more powerful without Bloomberg himself in the race? And he said he's going well, to couldn't be less powerful because look what a billion dollars did. He won nothing. I mean, he got so few delegates. It's incredible. I would say probably, well, I know now he's doing that because, you know, he's spiteful and he's a spiteful guy. I know him well. He's a very spiteful guy. He's very upset. Uh, he made a fool out of himself, to be honest with you. And it's, uh, he's not too happy about that. I think the first thing he should do is fire his political consultants because I could have told, I know him, I could have told him very easily, you can't win. You can put two billion in, you can't win. Okay, thank you, everybody. Right, guys, let's go. Right this way, guys. Thank you.